order to be effective in this work with few resources, right, it forces you to get clear on what you're doing and why you're doing it. By being clear, by executing on a mission over and over again, it helps to build trust in what we're doing. And I think it really, that clarity is kindness to all of our stakeholders. Welcome to the Data Chief. The Data Chief is a podcast for data and analytics leaders to share their personal stories and insights on technology, culture, and leadership. Today's guest is Jason Lally, the Chief Data Officer for the City and County of San Francisco. Jason is responsible for developing citywide data policies and leading the Data SF team to help remove barriers that prevent departments from maximizing their data's value. He's been with the city for over six years and came to open government and open data through his work in cities and regions across the country on data-informed community planning processes. On this episode, Jason and Cindy discuss the kindness of data clarity, why open data is just the tip of the iceberg, and the power of a declarative mission statement. Plus, they dive into Jason's 10 plus years of experience and unique trajectory that brought him to his current role. All that and more on today's episode with Jason Lau. Data Chief is presented by our friends at ThoughtSpot. ThoughtSpot makes it easy for you to use search and AI to analyze your company's data lightning fast. Business people at companies like Walmart, Hulu, and Medtronic use ThoughtSpot to quickly uncover new insights and turn them into action. And you can too. Learn more at ThoughtSpot.com. This week on The Data Chief, we have Jason Lally, the Chief Data Officer for the City and County of San Francisco. Welcome, Jason. Thank you, Cindy. A pleasure to be here. So I can I can pretty much predict it's really sunny out there, right? Yeah, it actually is today. Um, it's been mostly sunny, but a little bit cold here and there. Um, but today is actually like in the 80s. Well, yeah. Um, I know it, you still have those. Well, you have those microclimates, so yep. it depends. So when you look right. out your window, do you have a beautiful view of Alcatraz, the Bay Bridge, or <laughs> none of the above? None of the above. Uh, building next door, I'm in Civic Center, so I'm, a, I'm in a, more, a little more dense area, but I, I like that. Okay, great. And Jason, I understand, though, you are originally from the East Coast, mm -hmm. Philadelphia area. So what made you make the leap from East Coast to West Coast? I actually, growing up, I really love, I love Pennsylvania, I love Philadelphia. I just happened to graduate, you know, from the University of Pennsylvania about 2007, 2008 during the recession. And at that time, um, you know, what was available to me was, was out West and it was in Denver, Colorado at that time. And so I went West to invent the future, um, <laughs> as they say. And I didn't really look too far back because I started to really fall in love. Uh, without here. And I was visiting San Francisco. Um, a number of my friends had lived out here uh, while I was in Denver. And I kept coming back out. And I was just drawn to San Francisco for its progressive values, its beauty, its sort of complexity. Um, I really loved San Francisco. So so I, I came out further uh, to San Francisco uh, about seven years ago. Um, and I, I still go back to uh, Philadelphia uh, to see family. They're still out there. but And I love it but I don't want to leave here. <laughs> good, good. Well, so I'm sure you will pass each other, you know, going coast to coast. But, and, and so your journey from East Coast to West Coast almost parallels your journey, it seems to me, as a chief data officer. So mm -hmm. your background is really in city planning or mm -hmm. um, to take us through that. So, so you have the domain expertise. How did you go from that to being chief data officer? Yeah, from the outside, it looks like such a leap, but for me, it, it always felt like uh, increments toward toward where I am now. You know, I started uh, my this journey really even before city planning uh, with an interest in the intersection of people and technology. My grandmother will bring up every now and then uh, how one of my first books that they bought me when I was at Barnes & Noble at like 12 was a book on Java, the programming language. <laughs> I Wait, Java. when you were 12? Yeah. When, when you I was were like 12, 13. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Uh, I'm not a Java programmer. Um, I, sh <laughs> I like that fine, but I was really interested in technology. I was really drawn to programming computer languages, but I was also drawn to um, humanities and social studies. And all throughout 
uh, high school and into college, just really drawn to those fields. So I went to undergrad for information technology, had wonderful mentors. Um, Lynette Kvesny Yarger, Yarger was one of my original mentors at uh, Penn State um, and really introduced me to the language around, you know, the intersection of technology and people and policy. Um, and then uh, Dr. Chris Benner, also at Penn State at the time, uh, introduced me to urban urban planning. And I, I kind of got in there and what I wanted to do was really marry my, my interest in technology with impacting humans, with impacting civilization, thought, and society. And so urban planning was sort of the, the way that I could bring those things together. And in that, I, I immediately fell in love with um, urban spatial analysis and, and data and using data to inform that. And so that led me, and as you, as you mentioned, across the country, my first job in uh, Denver um, was working with Place Matters, a, um, a small nonprofit a think tank of sorts that was working across the country. Um, and we, we essentially advised folks on how to bring data and uh, information into urban planning processes. So I would do analysis, we would create games, scenarios, and bring that into a, a public setting and um, help people unpack the complexities of, of you know, urban futures. Um, that was really exciting work. And what eventually led me to San Francisco was, you know, an interest in in just getting really deep in, in a community and really like contributing directly. Um, so I, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I was always drawn to San Francisco and was very lucky to land in a position in the office of um, innovation at the time and then into the role that I'm in now. Yeah, no, that's great. And, and I want to clarify something. You said game, game scenario. So are you, is this gamification, um, you know, is there, is there a major, outbreak is their end of the world or, or, or what do you yeah. mean there the game scenarios yeah so in this case it were, you know scenario planning in a plan in urban planning context was more about less less severe maybe uh bookends but really looking at you know 30 years out if population changes one direction versus another what could that what impact could that have on land use or transportation well, if we make these kinds of changes how can we model those assumptions and that modeling is you know not an exact science it is scenario planning for a reason because the idea is to sort of use data as a as baseline, but but to help people under unpack and understand trade offs and give them a framework to also understand that like we're not predicting the future, but we're we're trying to get a sense of what might be um, so that we can make better decisions now um, for that future. Yeah, that's great. And uh, your the way you describe your vision for bringing people and technology and policy together is so powerful. And I love Data SF's mission. Can you share that? Or I'll read it to you. I'm sure you know it by <laughs> heart, right? Yeah. yeah. Our mission is to empower use of the city's data. And then what I love, you, I, I mean, it's so good. We seek to transform the way the city works through the use of data. We believe the use of data and evidence can improve our operations, the services we provide, which ultimately leads to increased quality of life and work for San Francisco residents, employers, employees, and visitors. It's really clear and profound. Did that come to you at 2 a.m. in the morning or was this crafted over years? No. Well, uh, to be perfectly honest, that is the outcome of work that I did with our, our first chief data officer, Joy Bonagoro. We've tweaked it a tiny bit here and there, a little wordsmithing here and there um, over time, but the heart of it is the same as what Joy and I worked on, you know, uh, gosh, six years ago. Um, she was our first uh, city chief data officer. Um, I'm a, the second. Um, so we worked on that together. And yeah, it, uh, it didn't come to me. It, it, I, I don't know. I can't speak on behalf of Joy. Maybe it came to her initially in an epiphany. But um, I think it really just speaks to both Joy and I's, our own values, which are that we really came, we both came to this work. And this is why, you know, I was so happy to join her when she, when she asked me to join the team. Um, because we both came to this work because we really believed that it was about people. It was about empowering people. Um, so that that was a, a you know a, a work of love on both of our parts um, in crafting that that mission. But but ultimately, I mean, she she really uh, was out in front on that one. 
Yeah, no, it's good. And I think partially why I was surprised is when I talked to many customers, their data and analytics teams don't really have a mission statement. They tend to be reactive. Mm -hmm. And when we look at the maturity of organizations in their use of data and analytics, normally the public sector and government is a little bit behind. Here, you seem so far ahead. How, how did that happen? Well, I appreciate that. And um, thank you for that. Uh, I, I often sometimes feel like we, we got so much to do and I, I realize that it's actually, it's a mix, right? And I think in this case, if we are ahead, if that is actually true, it's because working in the city, I mean, in order to be effective in this work with, with few resources, right? Mm -hmm. I think you, it forces you to get clear on what you're doing and why you're doing it, because you need to communicate that. You know, my team is uh, right now, we're, we're three of us total. And, you know, by being clear, by executing on a mission over and over again, it helps to build trust in what we're doing. And, and I think it, it really, that clarity is kindness to, to all of our stakeholders. And what it's done for us is, uh, you mentioned, re you know, not being reactive. I think it has, it has actually helped as new people come onto the team or roll off the team, you know, we are internally consistent so that we are being proactive. Every time we think of spinning up a new program or a new initiative, like we're, we're always thinking, are we doing this to, is it empowering others to do the work? Are we, or are we siphoning off something and putting it off to the side and, and trying to control it? Right. And we don't want to do that. Um, so it, it is actually something that is very embedded in the way that we, we do our work. I love that phrase. Clarity is kindness. Yeah, well, I, I, I steal that from, um, from Brene Brown, actually. <laughs> ah, <laughs> okay, yes, Brene Brown fan here too. <laughs> That's great. So, so open data in the public sector is huge. And there are so many data sets. Mm -hmm. And it's how do, we, how do we prioritize what is most impactful? What's been the biggest impact data set of 2020? Oh gosh, of twenty twenty. Well, I mean, I would be remiss in that this wasn't planned, um, <laughs> but it really is the work around COVID right now. Yeah, and and I'll speak to that a little bit. It's it's not just because obviously you know we, even without trying, everybody is looking at this data right now um, because uh, it, it. I mean, we are in uh, unprecedented times, um, so even without trying, you know, a lot of people are going to be looking at this. But I. I think in terms of the impact on the organization and what we're doing, um, it's tremendous because one, not only are we getting the data out there, but we're doing the things that we, we, we as a, a program as data SF have always wanted to do, which was level up the way we communicate, we respond, we, we take feedback. And so, you know, we produce the cases, right? You know, cumulative cases and these kinds of things, but really the work that's happening behind the scenes, the iterations to, to build more and more data and get clearer about the communication that that is um something i'm very proud of because it's not just us at data sf right if we're working with our partners at department of public health our, our controller's office and others and everyone is sort of oriented at this at this sort of same target which is really to increase again that clarity to the extent that we can right the data is kind of tricky mm -hmm. oh yeah but we're committed to uh listening to that feedback and trying to make that better over time. And I think when I, when I look at that, you know, that's where we want to be with, with any open data, regardless of a pandemic is that we want to make sure that we're helping people unpack and understand the data sets that we're putting out in the world. And we're not just doing checkbox transparency that we're communicating and that we're also listening. Yeah. So, pro so even at the start of the year, did you have a like flu outbreak or, you know, food poisoning outbreak tracker or no, was it really then 311 calls? Yeah, I mean, so in terms of before uh, the pandemic, yeah, I mean, the most, like the highest uh, used data sets really are 311 um, is, is very popular. Police incidents data set, very popular. Um, that's not unlike a lot of other cities. Restaurant inspections have always been a uh, popular mm. data set, right? There, there's sort of a set of very expected data sets, right? Common data sets that everyone kind of expects uh, local governments to have. But what I will say, one of the things that we've done with um, police incidents that um, I think over this past year, had, uh, or actually even before, two years ago, we relaunched that data set um, actually with our police department to 
create a little bit more clarity. Um, we've gotten fewer questions. People understand it a lot better. And that was actually another one of those data sets where the original way we published it, there were a couple of the challenges with it. They were a little kind of inside baseball uh, in terms of like ETLs and all this other stuff. But basically, you know, there was room for improvement and um, we were able to, to work successfully with a, a number of stakeholders to at least get that, that data set to be understandable and, and well-documented um, to the extent that the people are able to use it without a whole lot of our intervention. Um, and that's always our goal is we, we don't want to be out of the loop entirely, but we do want people to be able to use the data and understand it um, without having to go back and forth with a bunch of subject matter experts, right? We want to kind of distill that that expertise in a way that's understandable. Yes. That, that's one that's been, I think, impactful bef before um, our COVID response. So with the police application, the crime data set, was it a matter, you, you mentioned the ETL, do you think it was more getting the right data or was it how you define something? Or was it raising the le level of data literacy and fluency on both the police side and the citizen side and the policymaker side? Yeah. So I think, I mean, in this case, it was a little bit simpler because there's still work to be done there um, as far as like criminal justice data. When, if we think, if we zoom out, like there's plenty of work for us to do there and there will be work that, that happens um, around that. But on the police uh, incident, data set, I mean, it really came down to the data itself it needed to be restructured so that it was, it was more understandable. Um, there were fields that just were available, but not in there that would provide context and clarity. Um, for example, common things like, okay, we have an incident and an incident is related to a 911 call and there's a call number and then there's an incident number. Well, can we have those two together? Right. That's a really sort of simple I don't want to oversimplify this, but it's really important because now people can sort of begin to, to kind of track, you know, some incidents come in through 911 calls, but other incidents are, are not, right? And that paints a bigger, a bigger picture of how incidents are actually um, managed by the police department. So it creates more clarity around, you know, how that, by excluding some of those fields, it actually, it told a different story about how that data was collected and for what purpose. The other thing that we were able to do is just sort of work with the police department to help them understand what the common questions were based on all the questions we got, bundle that up, go through some documentation, and then really work with them as partners to kind of make sure we were being accurate in the in sort of that documentation. So at a policy level, nothing uh, really changed in broad strokes. Um, there's a lot of, again, there's work to be done there, but, but uh, it was really just about responding and understanding why people might want to use the data and how they were using it, that those things were reasonable and that we should just adjust to make sure that, that we're meeting those needs. Um, and so that, that was a process and, and uh, a successful one. Thank you. So what was the number one question? I think the number one question before we produced the new data set was, you know, actually the obvious one, and this, this was sort of a, related to the way that the data was produced, is that district boundaries didn't quite align with the redistricting process. Um, and again, that's because it was coming out of this old system and there are a whole bunch of inside reasons why, why that was difficult. But in making the shift to this, the new reporting system and, and then the, this new ETL, we are able to like clarify, yes, now the districts actually align to the, the realignment going forward, but they were, they were, this was causing a lot of confusion. Um, people were sort of trying to map these things out and seeing, you know, this didn't, correspond. The other thing, actually, now that I say that out loud, the other big one related to that is was just about geography. So the, there were certain inconsistent ways that things were geocoded, again, related to the fact that it was coming out of this, um, essentially this mainframe system. Yeah. And then the switch to the, the more modern uh, data warehouse system, we were able to clean up and clarify, you know, where, where things were happening. And we were able to introduce some um, more privacy controls that were more consistent across the data set. Um, so that, that was helpful. So now we can at least say this, these are the privacy controls. This is why, and it's not, it's sort of an inconsistent mishmash of things. Right. And, and is the number one thing that citizens want to ask of that data? Is it more about crime or I saw with the 311, it, it's more garbage and cleanliness of the street complaints. Yeah. So crime is, Common, at least in San Francisco, um, we're, we're lucky. Uh, we, we don't have a whole lot of violent crime, but we, we do have a lot of property crime. And, you know, there, so there have been a lot of over the past couple of years, there, 
lots of interest in understanding and tracking uh, incidents of, of property crime and follow up on that crime. Um, so that, that was, that was very common, but I think that that's sort of um, very neighborhood focused and, and there's a lot of neighborhoods that are interested in that, but zooming out, especially when you think about researchers and right, it, it just varies by audience. When you think about researchers and advocates, what they're really interested in is the criminal justice system. Right. Mm. And, and police incidents doesn't actually on its own, paint the picture. So there's, like I said earlier, there's more work to do there to really understand holistically, you know, what, what does recidivism look like? What is the disproportion? We know that there's a disproportionate impact on our residents of color, right? And it, it's important, we, you know, the city cares about reducing that. We want to, you know, those are the questions that people are asking. And the data that needs to be produced there is is actually captured by any number of, of organizations, not just the police department. So we find that's a question that cannot be answered just by looking at police, but it is one that, that sort of emerges, right? When, when people are looking, are starting with that, they they want to know, they immediately want to see the, the sort of the full life cycle of uh, the criminal justice system. And it's something that, you know, the city is, is working on. And I, you know, my, my hope is that we can really move on that um, and, get, and get a more, an increasingly holistic picture of, of that, uh, of the criminal justice system in San Francisco. Yeah. So when you think about the role of a chief data officer, it's all these competing requirements and stakeholders. You have citizens who want data, and then you have multiple agencies that might be involved here, especially then if it's if it's related to juveniles too. So how much of your time is on those internal, helping all the agencies and divisions use data better versus the open data? Oh, man. 80%, 80%. Is that? Uh, <laughs> no, I, know, I think like, that's the norm. Um, it's, it's, yeah. uh, it's hard. It's, it's always hard to estimate because it, for us, especially at data SF, we actually kind of look at it as a continuum, right? Um, we actually kind of start with our internal stakeholders because that sort of helps us actually get to um, more consistent, reliable, open data. Um, it doesn't always work that way in practice. Sometimes yes, you get data out, but for particularly for these kinds of things, right? Criminal justice, or housing or things that touch multiple departments, multiple systems, multiple people. The internal work is actually is, is the bulk. That's the, that's the iceberg, right? That's the part underneath open data that, that everyone sees out in the world where people don't see is all the work that happens internally. So I, as a chief data officer, actually, I think luckily I do have staff that I, I, I can have help work, work on sort of the, the machinery of getting open data out and making sure that it's reliable and consistent, but we do spend quite a bit of our time, you know, in that stakeholder engagement process on, on a variety of things. So you cannot do the open data without doing the internal work. I will say that. This was part one of Cindy's interview. Continue on to part two in your podcast player or click on the link in our show notes. The Data Chief is brought to you by our friends at ThoughtSpot. Searching through your company's data for insights doesn't have to be complicated. ThoughtSpot makes it easy. With ThoughtSpot, anyone in your organization can easily answer their own data questions, find facts, and make better, faster decisions. Learn more at ThoughtSpot.com.